Section 10.2, we're going to encounter another strategy for counting. So 10.1 was systematic listing. We talked about the fact that systematic listing works really nicely for small groups of things. Okay? If the groups get too big or the numbers of people you're picking from to put in the groups get to be too many, systematic listing is not going to be, it's not going to be your friend. It's going to take you too long. You're going to be really annoyed with me if I told you to do it that way. So we're going to need some strategies for some larger groups of people or, or items than we create these, uh, these counting techniques. So a little bit before we get to it is that we need to talk about some notation. You've maybe seen this before and you maybe haven't. Um, this is called a factorial. Um, the exclamation point is, uh, it does not mean I'm really excited, okay? That's not what this exclamation point means. It means that we multiply the number, whatever we start with, times the number one less than it, and one less than that, and one less than that, all the way down to the number one. We're multiplying a bunch of things out. And we define zero factorial to be the number one. It's just a definition that we take and we go with it. Um, it's kind of like when you do geometry. All of you probably took some kind of geometry course in high school. Nobody ever says to you and describes to you why a point is what you think it is. You just have this idea of what it is and you use it to do other things, right? It's the same idea here. We don't have an idea for this one. It's just defined to be this way in order to make the rest of it work in a way that makes sense, okay? So zero factorial is one. So we're going to do an example. Um, the example we're going to do is five factorial. So what this says we're going to do is we're going to multiply five times one less than five, which would look a lot like the number four, and one less than that, which is the number three. And we're going to keep going until I get to the number one, and I'm going to stop writing them out. And I'm going to actually multiply five times four times three times two times one. Okay. So if you have calculator, you're going to want it in this section. We're about to do a lot, of, a lot of multiplications, actually. So grab a calculator out. If you don't have one, it's okay. Just bear with us. We'll be fine. So what is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1? 120. 120 it is. Okay, there is a connection between this and the counting stuff. I promise we just need a little bit of, um, of technique before we get there. Okay, so this is 120. All right. Number 2 looks like something where we would normally say, hey, look, 8 divided by 4 is 2, and then we'd move on. Oh, look, this is 2. It's 2 factorial. We're done. Well, it doesn't work that way. And I want to show you why it doesn't work that way, and then I'll show you the shortcut for how to do it, okay? If I were to write out, by definition, 8 factorial and 4 factorial, just like I did above, I'd write 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. And on bottom, I would write out 4, 3, 2, and 1. I hope it's rather obvious that if you multiplied everything on top and you multiplied everything on bottom and then you divided them, you would not get the number 2. Right? The top's way bigger than 2 times the bottom. Way bigger. But what you do probably notice is that they repeat some of the same factors, right? The 4, 3, 2, 1 is on the top and on the bottom. Agreed? So once we write this out this way, we can see that the 4, 3, 2, 1s match, and they can reduce. It's a property of fractions that you did in middle school for the first time, maybe even late elementary. When you have multiplication factors like that, you have the ability to reduce them. So what you end up having uh, left is whoops just this part at the beginning, 8 times 7 times 6 times 5. So let's multiply out. What is 8 times 7 times 6 times 5? Yes. 1680. Okay, so you want to look at the shortcut then? Because if this says 8 factorial over 4 factorial, it's not that big of a deal to write this out. But if this said 50 factorial over 40 factorial, you do not want to write down 50 all the way to 1, right? In fact, number 3 has a 20 factorial, and that's already bigger than I want to write it all the way out. So let's look at a shorthand way of doing this so that we can preserve the, um, the integrity of what's happening and not get a wrong answer in the process. So what we can actually do is we can write down 8, 7, 6, 5, and when it matches exactly with the value on bottom, we can stop. Right? So when these are perfect matches, not just they're divisible by each other, 
when they are perfect matches for factorial, they can cancel out just like 4321 and 4321 canceled out. And that saves us some writing. On this one, not so big deal. On the next one, a little bit bigger of a deal, okay? And we're gonna encounter some large ones along the way that you're definitely gonna wanna have that fact use, use that fact for. Okay, so let's try the one where we have the 20, okay? So again, I don't really wanna write 20 down all the way to one. But I can go 20 down to, to 10 because there's a 10 factorial. There's a couple 10 factorials on the bottom, but it matches with one of them anyway. So I'm gonna write out 20 down to 10 factorial. 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, and 10 factorial. That's where I'm gonna stop. And one of my 10 factorials is gonna stay as 10 factorial. I'll do the second one just because it'll line up closer, like visually, to the 10 factorial I've got on top. The other one has to be written out. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. What do we think so far? Okay. Okay, so just as we did on the last one, the 10 factorials are gone. Now you have a couple options. Option number one, you can grab your calculator and you can multiply everything on top, and then you can multiply everything on bottom, and then you can do the division, and you will always come out with a whole number. So you can do that. Um, but if the numbers are very large or if there's very many of them on top, eventually your calculator won't be able to handle that expression. It'll get too large. It'll either turn it into scientific notation or it'll give you an error because the number gets even bigger than their scientific notation can handle. Usually the ones we do will turn into scientific notation. But that's not very helpful for us. And so we don't really want it to do that. So this one would probably work out just fine if you multiplied it out on the top, multiplied it out on the bottom, did the division, it'd be okay. But in general, we'd like to have a process to collapse them so that it doesn't turn into scientific notation if it's too large. And what we can do is we can actually reduce things. Now, there's a couple of ways you could reduce things. You can do it piece by piece, right? So I can say, hey, look, there's a 10 on bottom. What does 10 reduce with on top? Mm, 20, 10 divided by 20 is two, and I can do it that way. So that's totally fine. You can also look for pairs of things on bottom that actually equal something on top. That eliminates things a little quicker. So that's the one I'm gonna look at right now with you. So the 10, for example, and the two can multiply to give you a 20. So the 10 and the two can cancel completely with the 20. That's kind of nice. We won't be able to do this with all of our numbers, but we can do it with some of them. Do you see any other pairs of numbers that might be able to reduce that way? Three and six. Three and six. Okay, so three times six is 18. So it cancels with the 18. Wonderful. That might be it. Does it look like it? I think so on this one. Sometimes you can cancel more of them that way than others. So then we're down to piecewise doing it one at a time. So we're gonna move, what we're gonna do is we're gonna move down the list of the denominator to cancel with the numerator um, so that there's a nine first. So what will nine divide by or divide with? The answer is nothing right now, correct? So let's hold tight, we're gonna come back to the nine. How about the eight? Eight and 16, that'll work. So eight and the 16, the 16 will become a two. How about my seven? Seven and 14, so the 14 becomes a two. Five? Five and 15, the 15 becomes a three. And the four? Uh-huh, four and 12, and the 12 becomes a three. Okay, everybody good? And once again, if you wanted to at this point, multiply everything across the top and then just divide by nine, you can totally do that. That's fine. Your other option is that you can break the nine down into what it divides, in, divides out into. How does nine break down? Three, three. three and three. Do I have some threes in the numerator that I can cancel? Yeah, in fact, I have some threes that cancel that are written even, one of them. Um, so there's a, th well, actually both of them. I take that back. There's a three right here that can cancel with one of them. And then there's a three over here that can cancel with the other. All right, so here's the biggest potential pitfall along the way here. 
I write really neat. I'm very happy with the way I write. I love it. And I can still very easily lose something because this is a mess now, even on the neatest paper, agreed? Some of you do not write neat. It's gonna be even harder. <laughs> so you need to be really careful to go back and find all the pieces that are there that didn't get marked out, right? Yeah, it's gonna be a little tricky, okay? So you're gonna have to be careful to do so. <coughs> I'm running out of colors. Uh, let's go with a blue, I'll do a blue. So I have a 19, a 17, a two, a two, a 13, and I almost forgot my 11 even, 11 there too. Those are all the values that I need to multiply. 19, 17, two, two, 13, and 11, okay? Grab a calculator, multiply those out. Okay, do you agree with Dylan? Look good? Yeah. Okay, so what you heard me say, I'll say again. Be careful to find all the values that are left. It's really hard in this section of material to do partial credit because I can't see your work in any way. Are you with me? So if you don't have 184,756, I can't really do anything about it and give you like half credit because I don't know if you did it right. No way of knowing what happened, okay? All right. Um, number four. Number four is written in sort of a funny way. Again, we're gonna figure out why it's written that way next class period. Um, but it gives us a formula. It's got an n factorial on top, it has an r factorial on bottom, and it has an n minus r factorial on bottom, and it tells us some numbers for n and r, right? So we're just going to evaluate like you do in algebra and put the value for n in and put the value for r in. So the n is 28, so that's going to go on top. The r is 15, so that's going to go on bottom. And then the n minus r would be the 28 minus 15 on bottom with a factorial. Okay. Right now it feels funny that we did that. There's a reason, okay? But regardless, at this point it looks a lot like the last problem, doesn't it? It does. So I could actually, well, I'll take one more step to write this out a little bit simpler. Um, you know what, I'll just write it underneath. 28 minus 15 is 13. Okay, so in the denominator I have a 15 factorial and a 13 factorial. So I can write my 28 all the way down to 15, or I can write my 28 down to 13. It doesn't matter that much, but I usually just stop at the first option and I have to stop at. So I'm typically going to look at this and say, I'm going to stop at 15 factorial because it, it stops sooner. So I'm going to write my 28 down to 15. 28, 27, all the way down. Oh, I need more space on my screen. Let me do this. Okay, so there's my top written out to 15 factorial. I have the 15 factorial in the denominator. And then I have my 13 written down to 1. 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Okay, 15 factorials go away. Now we're gonna look at either pairing things up or dividing them out individually. Again, I usually look for pairs first. So do you see any pairs of things in the denominator that will completely cancel with something in the numerator? All right, six and four, wonderful. So six times four is 24. So the 24 goes away in my numerator. Okay, now what? Okay, 
Okay, 13 times 2 is 26, right? So the 26 is going to go in the numerator. Any others? Oh, that might be it. Oh, there we go. There's another one. Thank you. 9 and 3 are 27. I think that's the last one that's in pairs, right? Um, take note, you might have been like, oh, I didn't see that pair. I saw a different pair. Why didn't you cancel my pair? There's lots of options, right? Like we, we could have done something completely different with our canceling of pairs and it's gonna work out the same number in the end. So it doesn't matter what these pairs are that you see and somebody looks at them and sees them different. All right, so let's go one by one down the list now. And if we have any that are like my nine on the last one, we'll just skip over it and come back to it. How about 12? gotta skip it right right yeah because the 24 would have worked but we already canceled the 24 so we're gonna have to come back to that one how about 11 it does 11 into 22 22 gives me a 2 how about 10 yep 10 goes into 20 which gives me a 2 8 16 8 goes into 16 gives me a 2 so two could have paired up with all of those numbers had we not paired it up with the 13, right? I mean, like, we had choices. How about seven? 21. Seven goes into 21, giving me a three. And five? 25. Uh, five will go into 25 and give me a five. So again, if you want at this point to just multiply the things that remain on top and then divide by 12, you can. Or we can take the number 12 and we could break it down. So um, let's see. Do you want to break it down into six and two, or four and three? Do you care? Four and three. Four and three. All right, we'll do four and three. Okay. What's that? Because we canceled them out completely. Twenty-seven canceled out because it was nine times three, and the twenty-six canceled out as thirteen times two. Because when they canceled, they divided. So if it helps you to see it like this, what you can do is you can tell these were ones. The 27 divided by 9 times 3, 27 gave me a 1. Uh, the 26 gave me a 1. But when I did 25, 25 divided by 5, which still left me a 5 left over. Yeah. Uh, how about the 4? What will the 4 divide into? Or what would you like to look at? 28? Okay, that'll work. Um, we can do 4 divided by, I'm sorry, 28 divided by 4, and that gives me a 7. I'm running out of space above. Let me shift this down a little bit. There's a 4 here. Uh, how about my 3? Uh, you can do it with the 18, or you could actually do it with the 3 that's already listed here, too. Do you see that one now from above? So I'm going to do that one, just to give me one fewer number to multiply minute. Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, fix that one. Thank you so much. Okay, all good? Now we got to capture them all, right? Make sure we don't lose any along the way. Okay, so I have seven. I'm going to skip the ones just because they don't change any values. I have a five, 23, two, two, uh, 19. 18, 17, and 2. Lots of pieces. This is our biggest number so far today. What do we get when we multiply these out? Mine's bigger, Dylan. Okay. Yeah, I made this the number. What'd you get? That's what I have. Yeah. Okay. It is so easy to lose numbers. 37,442,160. Okay. So use your utmost care in doing these types of problems. Yes, sir. Is our goal when we do this? 
So um, if you're trying to do it like I've done, yes. Um, if you want to just leave something, like if we just wanted to leave the 12, that'd be okay. Just multiply everything on top, but then you'd have to do the division by 12 before the question's over. That's fine too. The more you leave in the denominator, the bigger the numerator is going to be before you do the division. And if it gets too big, your calculator won't be able to handle it. So there is a limit to what you can actually leave in the denominator and make that work, but you definitely could have left the 12. Yeah, okay. All right, so the title of our section here was called Fundamental, how do they call it? I've taught something recently. Using the Fundamental Counting Principle, okay? We haven't actually done that yet. Uh, we've just played around with uh, some notation, all right? We've, we've talked about what factorials do, how we cancel things out. Um, it, it's kind of like a big giant Sudoku or something. We're just doing a game, right? We're just playing with numbers. Well, there's a reason we're playing with the numbers. Um, the factorials are going to come into play in our section 10.3. Um, but we're going to take a look now at the fundamental counting principle and what it looks like. So it says, for a task consisting of k separate parts, where the number of ways to do the ith part is n sub i, then the number of ways to perform the task is n1 times n2 times n3 all the way to n k. Drop that down and we'll talk about what that literally means. Okay, this references a task, and we're going to talk about a task that you do every single day, every single one of you. You get dressed. I know you do because you're in here and you're all dressed, so I know you do it every day. All right, so you've got a task that consists of a certain number of parts, and for the simplicity of the argument we're going to talk about, we're just going to talk about the clothing we see on the outside of our body. So at some point in the day, you have to put on a shirt, at some point, pants and shoes, if you're leaving the dorm room, right? Shirt, pants, and shoes. That's three tasks, okay? Assume for the moment everything matches. It may not, but just for assume for the moment it does, okay? Well, however many shirts you have, that's one of the pieces of the task. So you have 15 shirts in your closet. That's 15. Pants, probably don't have as many pants as you do shirts, at least I know I don't. So maybe you only have like six pairs of pants. So 15 shirts, you have six pairs of pants. And you probably, have fewer shoes, maybe. Some of them are like, no, not at all. My husband has actually a lot of shoes. He has more than I do, okay? So shoes, so you're like, okay, well maybe I have four pairs of shoes just for the sake of argument. So what you would do is you would multiply the number of shirts, 15, times the number of pair of pants, which I think I said six, times the number of pair of shoes, what did I say, four? Four. four. And if you multiplied all those together, you would get the total number of different outfits you could have created, okay? That's the fundamental principle of counting. Um, another very classic case that we see used that you probably have encountered on a regular basis is when you go to like a fast food restaurant and they have a meal deal, right? And you have all these different like entree choices and you have all these different side choices, maybe a lot, maybe a not, right? Maybe it's fries or apple slices, I don't know. Uh, and then you have all these different drink choices, 
right? You can do the same thing. Well, how many different meal combinations are there, right? So you can figure out how many meals, different meals that could be created. Okay, so that's what this is talking about. And I know I've used things that only have three examples, but you can do however many you wish. And so we're actually gonna take a look, we are going back to section 10.1 right now, and we're gonna take a look back at our secretary, our treasurers, and our committees and so forth and see how that works. Okay, so you remember our people, right? Abigail down to Macy. And we're looking at the different ways of creating a president and a treasurer that are of different sexes. Okay, so what we do when we work with this principle of counting, what I do anyway, is I usually use placeholders. There's only two selections that I'm making. I'm making a selection for president and I'm making a selection for treasurer, that's it. So there's two blanks that I'm gonna fill in. Inside of the blanks are going to go the number of options we have for that blank, okay? So, how many different people could be president? Six, okay, six people. How many people could be treasurer then? It can't be six because we've already used one of them for the president. But it's not five either. It is three. Why would it be three? There's three people of the opposite sex. Now, if this wasn't even, right, three girls, three boys, we couldn't quite do the problem this way. All right? We'd have to do something different. You're not going to encounter something like that, so I'm not going to show you what we'd have to do differently. But we have six different people going to be president, but once that person's picked, they're either male or female, then the other person would be of the other category, and there's three more of them. So we get six times three, and we get 18. Flip back to section 10.1. Did we get 18 on problem one? Yes, we did. Right? Very different way of doing it. You need to know how to do both ways. But I wanted to show you that this works. It will yield the same answer. Let's do the second one. President, secretary, treasurer. How many people am I picking this time? Three. Three. But there's a bit more conditions. How many people can be president with the conditions that are described here? Three, because there's only three girls, right? Now, I know anybody can kind of go in the middle, but there's more of a strict condition on the ending, so I'm going to move to the end, just like we were doing when we were systematic listing. How many people can be treasurer? Three. Ooh, is it three or two? Okay, so, and I, as some of you said, is it one? So literally, it can only be one, but how many people do we have to pick from is what I was really meaning. So how many, two or three? Two. two. It's two. Why is it two and not three? Because somebody is already the president. So one of those three young ladies is already out of the running for the treasurer spot because she's already got an assignment. Make sense? How many people then can be the secretary? Four. Four. Why is it four? Because two people are already taken up. Two people are taken up and anybody else can be in the middle, right? Now, if it had told us that it had to be a boy, it wouldn't be a four. Right? But remember when we did this, we put the girls in the middle as well? Yeah. And again, we're multiplying these results together. What is four times three times two? 24. Did we get 24 on number two in section 10-1? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Cool, right? Okay, the next one's got a caveat to it. It's a little trickier. Do you remember what made the next one different than the others? There's a couple things, but... It didn't have strict guidelines, so I didn't have a boy-girl arrangement I had to worry about. What else was it? It was a committee instead of it being, um, you know, like just definite assignments of roles, right? Those are the two things that are different here. Okay, so let's do the process the way it sort of intuitively feels like we should, and we're going to run into a problem. It's a committee of two people. How many people can be in the committee, like the first person you pick? Six. How about the second person you pick? Five. Okay, what is six times five? 30. 30. Was that the answer that we got on number three? No. Was not. What answer did we get? 15. So why didn't this work? I duplicated names. You're exactly right, Leah. What, is that? what does she mean by that? What happened? They got used twice. So, for example, we'll just pick out a couple of them. Abigail, Nate and Nate Abigail were counted twice, weren't they? 
And they were counted twice because I was able to flip the orders, and I shouldn't really be flipping orders if I'm doing a combina or doing a, a committee, right? I shouldn't be flipping orders. So what happens is that yes, I would be doing this six divided by or six times five bit, but all of this six times five would then have to take this and divide by two. And what I'm doing is that I'm going to remove the double counts. Now, if it was specifically a president and a secretary, the answer would be 30, but it isn't. It's just a committee, so I have 15. So you have to be a little bit careful with committees. We're going to talk more about committees in Section 10.3. I do know that. Um, and how we can make sure this works, because this isn't quite working the way fundamental principle of counting says I'm supposed to do this, right? Like in this fundamental principle of counting, it didn't have anything that said divide by something when I'm done, right? What that actually tells you is that this process is not a very good process when I've got committees. Specifically, it's not a good process when the order doesn't matter. And the order doesn't matter on a committee, but it did on everything else, okay? All right, we're going to do a few other examples that are not related to the ones we've done so far. But they're going to, the next one anyway is, uh, I think maybe all of them, are going to be tests. Oh, yes, tests. You all love tests and quizzes, right? Yeah. Um, if you have been taking tests and quizzes very long, and most of you have, because, you know, unless you're homeschooled, most people do take tests and quizzes regularly. Um, guessing doesn't always achieve the best results, right? Okay. So what we're going to look at on these examples is how many different ways you could mark an answer key with given conditions. So the first one is a six-question true or false test. So there's six questions, which means I'm going to have six blanks. This is a short test, or you could say maybe it's a quiz. There's six blanks because there's six questions. How many different ways could you mark your answer key with trues or falses, if you really mark it. We're not talking about the possibility of leaving something blank. You're really gonna mark it. Two options, right? And it's gonna be two options in every single question, yeah? And we're gonna multiply them. So what is two times two times two times two times two times two? Six times. What is that? Mm -hmm. It's 64. So what does that mean? There's 64 different ways that that answer key could be marked, right? So if you are randomly guessing, like completely randomly guessing, like you have absolutely no clue, you have a 1 in 64 chance of getting the 100% on the quiz, the test. That's crazy, isn't it? All right, now educated guessing is different, right? Like we, we all are really more like the educated guessing when we don't know what's going on, right? And we don't generally like guess on every question. But that's a lot of different answer keys that you could actually have, correct? Okay, so let's change it from a true-false test now to a multiple-choice test. We're going to still do our six questions. But our six questions are now going to have how many options for each of them? Five, because there are five answer choices, it says. So instead of twos, I have fives. So we're going to multiply five times five all the way down. And instead of 64 different answer keys that we could have, right, how many did you get? So this is the way an ACT works, right? Five answer choices for most of them, and there's way more than six questions. You're not going to randomly get a perfect score on an ACT without knowing stuff. Like, that's not going to happen. You can't guess well enough because you have a one out of 15,625 chance of getting six questions right on a multiple choice test. It's huge. All right, let's change the test again. Matching. Do you like matching? I kind of like matching better than multiple choice, personally. Can at, least, at, least, at least matching where you can eliminate things. I had a history teacher in high school that did not do that. You could still use something more than once. You could use something not at all. It was the worst. Absolutely. Sometimes answers would have two answers. It's 
terrible. Okay, that's not this test. <laughs> this is just your normal matching test. So it's only five questions. Okay, we've changed our number of questions here. So we've got five questions. So there's only be five blanks, all right? And it's got five answer choices where each answer is used once. So the first time that you answer the question, how many choices do you have? Five. five. But once you do that, you do the whole, I get a mark it out thing, and I have fewer choices the next time, so it's a four. And then, Three. and then, Two. and one. And this looks like something we've already done today, right? Mm -hmm. Not only generally speaking, but specifically, we have done this problem. Five times four times three times two times one. And we got 120. Mm -hmm. So with a matching test, I have fewer options, right, than a multiple choice test because their answer options that I have to pick from get smaller as I go down the line. All right, one more test and we're done for today. Are you ready? This is now, this is another way that you sometimes see matching tests done. Five questions, but you're given a test bank that has more than five choices in it, right? Yeah? So we have five questions, but how many choices do we have the first time we answer the question, first question? We have 10 choices, and then we eliminate it, and then we have nine, and then eight, seven, and six. So if we multiply these together, it will be bigger than 120. 30,240. Now I want to draw your attention to one more interesting thing that's happening here. This question was five factorial, correct? Mm -hmm. Right? This question is actually 10 factorial divided by five factorial. It's removing the five factorial at the end that are no longer there. Okay? All right, we'll pick back up on Tuesday. It's section 10.3.